Thank you, uh, members. Um, what I would like to say is that I would advise that one of our colleagues was unwell. I am assured by a business manager that that individual is in fact feeling better. And on that basis, we will now resume business. Point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Presiding officer, I'm asking if you would take a, a motion without notice to adjourn the proceedings for this evening. Um, we have seen. I appreciate mem some members don't want to hear from disabled members, but we will not be silenced by your shouting. I, I, members, could, could we just please listen to the member who, who is on his feet? Mr. Thank Balfour, you, Convener. Con 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 I've made this point now on two occasions um, yesterday, and I'm now rising to do it again. Um, it's, we, are, we have seen the business motion for tomorrow. Uh, we know we are returning tomorrow afternoon. There will be opportunity at that point to consider the rest of the amendments. In my view, um, we should now uh, firstly adjourn uh, so that we can have rest. Those that have caring responsibilities can go and do those responsibilities and the whole chamber can return tomorrow to complete this process in an orderly way. So I would ask if this motion would be accepted. Uh, th um, well, I perhaps deal with Mr Balfour's point of order and I'll take the Minister. Um, I, I would advise Mr Balfour, I thank him for his point of order, that the welfare concerns raised today and yesterday have indeed been noted um, that we have a decision of the Bureau to proceed with stage three amendments this evening and therefore we will continue with the business as agreed by the Bureau uh, and therefore I am not minded to accept the motion without notice. I call the Minister for his point of order. Just for some clarity, uh, presiding officer, the member, our colleague, uh, actually wants uh, everything to proceed and is pretty keen that she will remotely uh, kind of vote uh, from a, a room where she's a lot cooler and a lot comfier. Uh, thank you, Minister, for that update. Um, I would now intend to forward to John Mason. Uh, I thank you. I, I take the point that's been made already, but uh, would it be possible? I know that the chair, the presiding officer, yourselves and your colleagues have been very generous with people's time, but would it be possible for you to encourage speakers to be shorter and therefore we would reach the end quicker? I, I thank Mr Mason for his point of order. I would point out, of course, that in the course of the stage three amendment uh, proceedings, no member has been subject to any time limit uh, and it would perhaps be uh, somewhat incongruous to um, proceed on that basis now, although of course all members will have heard the point that Mr Mason has raised. Um, I would hope I could return now to the stage three amendments and I think Mr Whittle was finishing up. Mr Whittle? Yes, <laughs> I, 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 I won't start again, uh, <laughs> the Deputy Presiding Officer, but uh, I, I, um, can I just obviously um, say that uh, we, we wish our colleague um, well, and uh, we're thinking. Her. <laughs> so, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, to continue, uh, there are over one million women and girls participating in sport in Scotland, and it's been a long fight to try and get equality between men's and women's sport. And we've come such a long way in my lifetime. In setting this bill, it is imperative that the government considers the impact of the bill across all of society. It does not pass the buck and negate its responsibilities for the changes it proposes. We must protect women's rights as well as ensuring trans rights are protected, the same as for every person. We all want equality in society, but as I have said before, you do not create equality for one group by creating inequality in another. Standing officer, much has been made of other countries adopting uh, similar trans rights, so I, I took the opportunity yesterday to look at Denmark and their experience of developing trans rights. Now, they recommended that sex should determine participation in elite sports events and that otherwise sensible measures be taken to ensure a balance between inclusion of trans-identified people and, for instance, women. Their recommendations were met with harsh criticism from the D Danish LGBT organisations, much as some of us have as well. However, they made the recommendations due to an understanding of the growing need for protecting women's sport as well as including trans-identified people where it is reasonable to do so and not at the expense of girls' and women's possibilities in sport. 
Yes, I will. Cabinet Secretary. Just for a point of fact and clarity, that would be for the UK Government to decide if it wanted to do that with sport, because obviously what he's referring to is a reserve matter. So just for clarity, and he may wish to address that to the UK Government, it's not something this Government could do. Brian Whittle. Sorry, um, um, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure, as you, you were previously the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Sport and Health, you would recognise that we do have an organisation called Sport Scotland in this country. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, members, 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 uh, we want to hear one voice at the moment, and that is from the member who is on his feet. Mr. Whittle, please resume. Spending officer. So, perhaps we can learn from other experiences and not make the same mistakes that, that they made. I am asking for guidance for sports for teachers and coaches, as given by the Scottish Government, and that relevant data should be collected to establish the consequences of this bill. To the final amendment 68, it is essential. It speaks directly to the safety of the trans community who are seeking health care. Not only that, it protects our health care professionals in their ability to deliver the very best care to all. To demonstrate this, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to quote from a letter I received from an NHS consultant, clinical scientist and medical physics expert in ionising radiation. He quoted from the statutory regulations in optimising radiation exposure, which states that, and I quote, in complying with the obligations under this regulation, IR MER 2017 Regulation 12, <coughs> paragraph 8, the <coughs> practitioner and the operator must pay particular attention in relation to, where appropriate, individuals in whom pregnancy cannot be excluded and who are undergoing a medical exposure, in particular if abdominal and pelvic regions are involved, taking into account the exposure of both the individual and any unborn child, or those individuals who are breastfeeding. Paragraph 9 states, and again I quote, the employer must take steps to ensure that clinical evaluation of each exposure is recorded in accordance with the employer's procedure, including, where appropriate, factors relevant to patient dose. Factors relevant to patient dose, one of which is biological sex, Deputy Presiding Officer. That, cl that cl clinician uh, states, and again I quote, that the regulators of IRMER regulations in the four home nations are already seeing examples of gender recognition affecting the safety of patients. For example, a pregnant biological female patient identifying as male gender was inappropriately exposed to an abdominal CT scan, including their unborn child. And in another example, a biological male patient identifying as a female gender inappropriately had a CT scan of their prostate, which had been mistaken as a growth on an ultrasound examination. At the moment, our clinical information systems record sex. They do not record biological sex and gender. As such, there are implications for patient safety through gender recognition, including the safety of unborn children and breastfeeding infants. He goes on to say the importance of a patient's biological sex being known prior to the commencement of any medical or clinical treatment will clearly become increasingly important as more patients identify with a gender different to their biological sex. I therefore fully support Mr Whittle's proposed amendments to assess the impact of the Act and hopefully inform how clinical risk can be mitigated. I also heard, uh, heard an instance where a female identifying as a male and not informing health care providers being treated for chest pains and eventually being diagnosed with the consequences of endometriosis. That presenting officer is an inherently dangerous position for a patient and not great for the health care professional either. With that in mind, it seems ridiculous that consideration is being given to remove the words woman and female from the vocabulary in a health care setting. Are we really going to start calling women people with a cervix? Why are we not calling people with, uh, males people with a prostate then? Why the discrepancy? And why is it taking a male to stand up in this chamber and highlight the erosion of women's identity? Presiding officer, this is exactly what I'm trying to do with these amendments. Mitigate risk. Uh, Ruth McGuire. I thank Brian Whittle for taking an intervention. It might just be because we're late in the day, but he's surely not suggesting that he's the first person to draw attention to these issues. Brian Whittle. I'm the first person to draw attention to these issues in this debate. Um, again, presiding officer, what I'm trying to do here with these amendments is mitigate risk in sports participation. Female, male and trans athletes 
and in protecting the trans community in administering health care. The government cannot create legislation then abdicate responsibility for the consequences of the legislation to other parties. Surely that is not too much to ask. I ask those who have spoken to me across the chamber and who have intimated reservations on the bill to support my amendments. This is one piece of legislation that, if passed as currently drafted, will open up routes to harm, especially for women and for the trans community. This is exactly the reasons we wanted the time to discuss and examine the consequences of the bill, time that has been denied by those in government who are forcing this bill through without proper parliamentary scrutiny. We cannot pass this and then think about amending it at a later date as data is collected. We cannot vote for this bill in a vacuum without any checks and balances. I urge the Chamber to vote for these amendments. This is not party political, which is why I have a free vote, nor anti any part of society. Rather, it is pro every part of society. It is about making the best law possible from the outset. I urge colleagues from across the Chamber, from across the Chamber, do not hide behind your party colours. If you have any doubt, and I know many of you do, please, please do the right thing. Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. Members will note that we have passed the agreed time limit for the debate on this group to finish. I have exercised my power under Rule 9.8.4a uh, small c to allow debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. I call Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 13 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I will try to keep my uh, comments uh, reasonably brief. Uh, in regard to uh, Amendment 122, um, I will be supporting uh, Mr Mason. In regard to Amendment 57, I think um, my colleague Pam Gosso spoke very clearly in regard to some of the issues that could happen, um, which I'm sure are unintended. Uh, I totally recognise that for the majority, for most of us in this chamber, we don't follow um, a belief or a religion that will be impacted by this. But we are also here to protect minority religious groups as well, to allow individuals to be able to worship uh, in freedom, to be able to worship as they uh, believe is the right way forward. Um, Pam Gocho pointed to examples from the Muslim faith. I think it would also be true to say that those uh, from the Jewish faith uh, and some from the Christian faith will also uh, be struggling to work out how they will be able to practice their religious freedom. And I think to be able to record and monitor that and see the effect on that will be very helpful. And I do hope the Chamber will support these. Um, I think uh, my colleague Brian Whittle has spoken very clearly in regard to the issues around sport. If I can just very briefly come from this from a slightly different angle, um, I really enjoy watching my two daughters play sport. Uh, they enjoy it, it's good for their physical health. We in Scotland want our children to be more healthy, but we all know that that it, it, age from when they become teenagers, particularly uh, female teenagers, to keep them actively involved in sport is very hard and very difficult. And I know as a father, if my daughter is suddenly going to be never winning, never have an opportunity to win, perhaps putting her body in physical danger because someone is stronger and bigger and physically different from her, she will simply walk away. And I think this can have dangerous consequences going forward for future generations in regard to keeping our young folk fit and healthy. If I can turn to my own two amendments in regard to 13 and 14. Um, these amendments, I think, are fairly straightforward. Um, if I'm honest, I think probably um, the member Ash Regan's amendment is better, so if we've got to choose, I would choose her amendment uh, before mine. But they seek to do the similar thing. I'm allies to recognise that we have a diversity within society, that we have to protect all characters, all protected characteristics, whether that's religion, disability, and other areas. And all we are simply asking is that the bill has that at the heart of it, so that people understand how it all uh, fits in. Um, I also support uh, my colleague Tess White's 
uh, amendment as well. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I call Ash Regan uh, to speak to Amendment 71 and other amendments in the group. Ms Regan. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer. Uh, in Norway, a female artist is facing criminal charges for stating that men cannot be lesbians. Now, I fully accept that some people hold beliefs that I do not agree with, and I no doubt hold beliefs that others do not agree with, but I wouldn't compel others to agree to my beliefs. I think we should all be free to express ourselves and indeed even to cause offence, and that's important. And I think uh, in terms of the wider debate on these issues, um, it hasn't benefited from that attempt to sort of shut down those questioning voices and, and voices that are suggesting things that other people may not believe in. So, and to come on to the point that was raised by Mr Whittle, I think it is very important that women feel that they have the right to the words that describe them, their lives and their experiences. Um, and recently I happened to listen to a recording of Mary Richardson. Um, she was describing her time as a suffragette and once when she was on a train, she had left the scene of an act of civil disobedience. And she sat in that train carriage and listened to man after man after man describing all the violent ways that they would like to kill a suffragette if they ever saw one, obviously not realising that there was one sitting among them in the carriage. And I must say, I was quite struck by the parallels um, that we are facing today. So threats to women who speak out, threatened with rape, with murder. Even a hundred years later, men are still feeling entitled to threaten and to kill women simply for saying something that they don't agree with. So I want to ensure that no one is compelled to speak up or about a holder of a GRC in any particular way simply because they hold a GRC. And the judgment in For Starter made clear that the protection of a belief means nothing without the ability, sorry, without the protection in order to express that belief. So we need to be clear this afternoon that a process of state certification does not in itself introduce new constraints on Article 10 rights, except insofar as the bill explicitly introduces those constraints. So I would like also to talk about the effect of Section 22, and that has been raised already by Ms Gozel, on what people may lawfully say. Um, I also attempted uh, to bring amendments on this subject, which I know uh, Ms Baker also tried to do at earlier stages. Um, and I think those would have allowed us to discuss whether the provisions of that section remain appropriate for what is now a much larger and obviously more varied group of GRC holders than was envisaged by the legislation when it was drafted in 2004. So the Employment Lawyers Association have previously queried whether Section 22 remains the best approach to privacy protection due to its potential to have a chilling effect on lawful information sharing. Um, the association asked why the protections properly afforded to everyone with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, whether or not they have a GRC under the Equality Act, need to be enhanced in this way for GRC holders only. So I'd like to take this opportunity to put on record my understanding that the offences in Section 22 only apply to a person who has obtained information about a GRC holder in an official capacity and have no relevance outside that context. And they impose no other additional legal constraints relating to GRC holders or individuals who are going about their day-to-day -day lives. And I'd welcome an undertaking from the Minister that the Scottish Government will now look very carefully at amendments that were rejected as inadmissible for today, where these suggested additions to the exceptions in Section 22. And it'd be reassuring, I think, for the Chamber to hear the Minister confirm that the Government is open to, open to using its powers to amend Section 22 by order before the Bill is brought fully into force, where that can be properly justified. And I, I am aware there was a commitment to look further at Section 22 made in 2019, which remains to be fulfilled. And of course, now is the time to tie up that loose end. Thank you, Ms Regan. I now call Tess White to speak to Amendment 131 and other amendments in the group. Ms White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We've heard over the last few days how important reporting is from several of the mem members. 
Amendment 131 creates a statutory duty for ministers to consult on how and how often they should report on the legislation's impact on women and girls in consultation with this group. Ministers must then make regulations specifying the details for reporting on that impact. Amendment 136, which goes hand in hand with 131, delays commencement of Section 2 under the regulations have been made. I have brought these amendments back from Stage 2 with modifications for two reasons. I was deeply, deeply concerned by the lack of debate surrounding these amendments during Stage 2 proceedings. The Cabinet Secretary gave them cursory mention, but nothing more considered than that in such a massive grouping. The discussion of these amendments at Stage 2 felt like a microcosm of the wider GRR debate and the Bill's impact on women and girls, dodging the key issues and denying there's a problem to begin with. But events since Stage 2 in just a few short weeks demonstrate precisely why these amendments are needed. The UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls has raised concerns that the Bill's proposals present potential risks to the safety of women. Meanwhile, last week's court ruling underscores further why the legislation's impact on women and girls should be reviewed on a statutory basis as we move forward. It states that sex is not limited to biological, biological or birth sex and that a person who obtains a GRC in their required gender legally changes their six and like sex. And like Pauline McNeill, I too am confused by this. The Scottish Conservatives call for the bill to be paused while the implications of the verdict are considered. But the Scottish Government has ignored these calls. <coughs> However, it desperately, desperately needs to recognise that this legislation gives the key to the door to an undefined group of people by making it significantly easier for them to change their sex. I believe the intent of this bill is good, but the unintended consequences could be greater for the rights and safety of women and girls. Those acting in bad faith will exploit loopholes where there is access to women and children, and there's a real risk that women will exclude, self-exclude from services. Last night, Vital safeguards put forward by Russell Finlay and Michelle Thompson were rejected. More than ever, post-legislative scrutiny of this bill's impact on women and girls is so important. The, um, yes? Julie Martin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm really glad that Tess White voted for my amendments, which I think have the same effect that uh, Russell Finlay and Michelle Thompson's uh, amendments had, but are actually competent and in line with the European Convention on Human Rights. Tess White. Th thank you, Gillian Martin, for that. I didn't feel that it was robust enough, and Gillian Martin said yesterday, so we both come from the energy sector. The energy sector looks at risk and risk management. It also really focuses on data and data report, reporting, and that's the substance of my amendments. Yeah. Yeah. The Cabinet Secretary objected not to the substance of my amendments, but to their drafting. As such, I instructed the Bill's team to make the regulations clearer to address these concerns. There, there are some strong amendments in this group, and I'm supportive of them all. I would briefly like to highlight Brian Whittle's amendments 58 59 and 67 on sport. Statutory changes through the GRR bill will have a significant impact on sport. This is already happening, but this legislation will accelerate it. That has implications for the safety of competitors and for fairness. It is only right that this should be reviewed on a statutory basis. It is the responsible thing to do. My amendments are a bandage. They're a sticking plaster. I deeply, deeply regret the Scottish Government's disastrous handling of this aspect of the process, but this is an opportunity to change course. I therefore strongly urge colleagues to support amendments 131 and 136. Thank you. Thank you, Ms White. I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I speak in support of Amendment 122 by my colleague John Mason. 
A particular area of concern in this bill has been its potential impact on the female prison population. Whatever the reason for a woman being imprisoned, what matters is that they are in the Scottish Government's custody and care, and it falls upon ministers to do their utmost to ensure that these often vulnerable women are safe while serving their time. A 2011 Swedish cohort study analysed crime rates after surgical sex reassignment of male to female that was my alarm, I'm glad to say, uh, trans people, and found that they retained a male pattern regarding criminality and violent crime. So trans women are therefore no more or less likely to commit crimes than any other biological males. Official UK government data shows that as of March this year, the total number of transgender prisoners in England and Wales was 230, 97 of whom are sex offenders, around 42%. Of the general male prison population in England and Wales, 19 per cent are sex offenders. In the United States, of the federal system's 1,143 male to female transitioners, nearly half have a history of sexual offences. So given that trans women are no more likely than other anatomical males to commit sexual offences, the obvious corollary is that there must be a significant number of sex offenders in prison who falsely claim to be trans. The danger is that men who commit sexual offences may claim to be transgender in order to avoid imprisonment in the men's estate. And the very presence of anatomical males in women's prisons can cause distress to vulnerable female prisoners, many of whom have been the victim of male violence. A key issue with this bill is that by making it easier to acquire a GRC, more male sex offenders may pretend to be trans in order to be incarcerated in a female prison, whether to prey on women or do easier time. Unlike in England, Scotland's prison service already uses individualised risk assessments to determine how trans prisoners are managed, whether those prisoners have a gender recognition certificate or not. However, in November 2021, it was reported in the Times that 12 trans prisoners convicted of violence or sexual crimes had been accommodated in Scottish women's jails within the previous 18 months, according to figures released under Freedom of Information. So the review of the Cabinet Secretary spoke of earlier is welcome, if belated. Rona Hotchkiss, former governor of Conton Vale Prison and a constituent of mine, said women were being exploited as, and I quote, unwilling participants in a social experiment by being housed alongside trans women, adding that women are being told, and again I quote, their concerns, their fears, their despair must take second place to the feelings of men who identify as women. I therefore firmly believe that no one who is anatomically male should be incarcerated in a women's prison. The inconvenient truth is that trans women are physically male and, as a group, present the same hazard that other men present, those who pretend to be trans even more so. If a fox said it was a chicken, would you put it in a hen house? Of course not. Now, back in 2015, an American woman who identified as black and was a chapter president for the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People was outed as being entirely of European heritage. Denounced worldwide, she lost her university job teaching the black women's struggle and was accused of being a race faker, of wearing a costume and lying to claim ownership over a painful and complicated history she wasn't born into. Yet if she'd declared herself to be a bloke rather than black, everyone would have been expected to agree with that self-identification. This is real emperor's new clothes stuff. Reality must intrude at some point. Allowing anatomical males who self-identify as women into prison is unacceptable and a safeguarding nightmare. Support Amendment 122. Thank you, Mr Goosen. I call Stephen Kerr. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to follow my colleague, and I have to say that I agree with everything that he said. Um, these are not easy things to talk about because the, we're into the realm of where people may wish to take offence. But I think it's important in this context that we can speak as freely as we are speaking to each other. And there's been an immense degree of respect. Um, before I say anything further, because I'm going to address... Would someone like to intervene? Yeah. Uh, Mercedes Vialba? <laughs> Is the member's microphone on? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. Um, would the member like to clarify in what way the previous contribution demonstrated respect? Because from where I was sitting, it was extremely disrespectful and it was bordering on hate speech. 
Well, I, I'm not sure that um, I am here Kerr. to defend my colleague, but he's speaking as a parliamentarian in a parliament of adults. And I think we respectfully heard him deliver his speech. I think if the member had wanted to make an intervention to say what she's just said, it would have been much fairer on the member, because he's in a situation now where he can't readily respond to that, although he could intervene on me if he wishes uh, and, and respond on his own behalf, but I'm not sure if he wants to. But before I go any further, because I wish to speak probably fairly exclusively about the subject matter around freedom of religion or belief, I would refer members to my register of interests. This is a subject area that is very important to me personally. Um, to that extent, I must say that I probably agree with what John Mason said earlier. I think many of us would rather have been at the carol uh, service tonight. Um, and sadly, as just been illustrated, sometimes there's too little joy to the world. And I think sometimes we should afford each other the benefit of the doubt when it comes to the way that we choose to express ourselves, however clumsy that might be. But I wish to support uh, Amendment 57 in the name of Pam Gosell in particular, and Amendments 13 and 14 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, and Amendment 71 in the name of Rash, Ash Reagan. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not supporting the, the amendment in the name of John Mason, or indeed Brian Whittle's amendments, or Tess White. So I think they have also given excellent speeches, um, which have also respected the subject matter, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but I would specifically like to refer to the freedom of religion or belief issues. Now, on the 20th of October, I was invited by Foisal Chowdhury to attend a meeting in this parliament, in one of our committee rooms, where he and I were privileged to meet with a group of about 60 people from all kinds of backgrounds, all forms of religion and belief, and none, and there were also representatives there from the trans uh, community. I have to say that the whole evening was exceptional in this respect, that it showed that it was possible to discuss very sensitive issues in the same respectful way that I think in the main we've been discussing them in this chamber for the last couple of days. Um, and that has instilled in me a belief that when it comes to human rights, it is always possible when people are speaking to and listening to each other for there to be an accommodation. And I think that that's what is, that is what is required in respect to some of the clashes that occur in respect to human rights. But at that meeting, these uh, representatives of Scotland's major faiths, uh, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, um, Christian, um, they, they expressed their views very forthrightly. Faisal Chowdhury and I gave them their commitment that we would allow their voices to be heard in the proceedings of the Parliament, and I do so now as a great honour, just raised the concerns that they had in relation to their faith. They felt that they had largely been left out of the process that has brought us to this point this evening. I don't think that's changed since October, sadly. They had grave concerns about women's rights and the safety of women's spaces. That issue was raised repeatedly. And questions were asked, and I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will take the opportunity to be as clear as she possibly can be, because questions were asked about the continued ability of religious institutions to maintain sex-segregated spaces. To many people of faith, this is a very important issue. Now, I recognise that to some people, those who hold religious faith and it becomes a leading and perhaps even dominating influence in their lives and how they choose to spend their time. This, this may all be a bit of a mystery to some people as to how religion can be so important to people. But I would ask uh, colleagues across the chamber in consideration of these amendments to remember, let us, if you are less religious, let us try and put ourselves in the shoes of the other people that we're talking about. To them, their religion is the most important thing in their lives. And to some people, their religious beliefs are more important than their very lives. I will, of course. 
Ross Greer. I'm very grateful for the member giving me on that point. I would just ask if he would recognise that many trans and non-binary people are people of faith, and he's certainly not speaking on their behalf at the moment. Stephen Kerr. <clears throat> well, I'm not quite sure why Ross Greer says that I'm trying to speak on behalf of anybody. I'm talking about a meeting I attended where representatives of faith groups in Scotland expressed their views. Foisal Chowdhury was there. And so were representatives of the trans community in Scotland. It was a very good meeting. So I'm not quite sure that I understand where Ross Greer is coming from. I'm happy for him to come back in if he wishes to give further explanation. I'm Ross grateful uh, to the member for that further opportunity. Um, my discomfort with his speech as a person of faith, which, which he knows, is uh, the implication is there's a tension between the beliefs, the beliefs of people of faith and the rights of the trans and non-binary community. And I'm simply making the point that many trans and non-binary people are part of faith communities. Stephen Kerr. <clears throat> no, I think there's a misunderstanding here. I, what I'm trying to say, very simply, is that people of faith who were present in a meeting in this parliament on the 20th of October expressed genuinely held concerns. And I think, as a matter, again, of respect, it's important that we accept that people may feel differently and have a different view than us, even though we have, may have a view about the origins or the motives or whatever of those beliefs. And that's what this group of people of faith felt. They felt concern, as I've said already, about the need for their faith groups to get a fair hearing in this process. They felt a concern about women's rights. They felt a concern about their ability to maintain sex-segregated places. And I'm sure Ross Greer would recognize that that's a, a very important part of the worship of many faith groups. And they also had concern about the, the bill's attempt to move the, the, the age uh, um, for self-ID to 16. They felt, they felt unanimously that that was too, too young. But the reason, the reason I mention all this is because, as I say again, th this whole idea of uh, freedom of religion or belief, um, which is at the core, I believe, of our human rights, um, which includes freedom of conscience, as is highlighted in Ash Reagan's amendment, specifically referring to Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And the, the reality is that this is all about an individual's right, which I think we would all agree is sacrosanct, to determine their own path in life. And for some, this means following the teachings of a faith, and for others, it doesn't. But that's all encompassed within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article that defines what freedom of religion or belief is. And I believe that this freedom underpins so many of our other freedoms, because without freedom of conscience, uh, we don't have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom of assembly. And in the context of Article 18, that I mentioned earlier, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and Article 9, that's quoted in Jeremy Balfour's amendments, is the right to worship publicly in accordance with the teachings of your faith group. Now, I think faith groups require some assurance from the Cabinet Secretary in response to this grouping of amendments that their right, particularly, and I'm thinking now of the different variations of Islam, of Judaism, of Sikhism, Buddhism, where public worship is segregated as part of their belief system. I think they need to hear it categorically stated that that right will in no way be compromised through the passage of this bill. And if this bill passes as currently worded, could faith groups feel confident that they can keep their form of public worship? And then there are other more basic questions that I feel that the Cabinet Secretary could, could approach in her summing up. And, and that is in relation, for example, to Catholicism where it is well known that only men can become priests and only women can become nuns. So I think it's important just to clarify that the Cabinet Secretary confirms that if a biological male who has a gender recognition certificate stating they are female, would they still be legally entitled to the priesthood or some other religious right or privileged position if this bill passed? I will give you. 
Okay, thank Stephen Kerr for taking the intervention. Um, Graham Simpson, sorry. I, just, uh, I, I want to steer him back, if I can, to uh, Pam Gosal's uh, amendment, because um, I listened uh, very carefully to Pam Gosal. She would make a very uh, passionate speech. And so I would ask Mr Kerr, would he agree with me that Pam Gosal, the amendment actually deals with uh, not, not so much the things that Mr Kerr is talking about just now, but specifically um, medical examinations. And I don't think, I mean, members may have, may have got the impression that Pam Gosal uh, is a, was, was asking for special treatment for religious groups, and I don't think she was. So would he agree with me that actually what she was asking for was for us to respect the right of individuals, women, <coughs> women mainly, to ask for um, you know, somebody, somebody of a specific gender to examine them. And that's, that's all the amendment does. Stephen Kerr. Yes, that, that is correct, that, that, that um, Pam Gosnell's amendment, 57, is exactly what, what my friend has just outlined. But I'm specifically focusing on amendments 13, 14 and 71, which underpin the freedom of religion or belief concepts that I am currently trying to speak about. And, presiding officer, it's, it's not only me that's bringing these concerns to this debate, obviously. I've quoted faith groups from the meeting that Faisal Chowdhury organised that I was privileged to attend. But the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls also wrote in the letter that's been much quoted over the last two days. This is what she wrote. A failure to provide single-sex services to women born female alongside gender-specific services targeting women in all their diversity could amount to unlawful indirect discrimination because of religion under the Equality Act of 2010. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, guarantees freedom of religion or belief under international law. Furthermore, Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 states that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Furthermore, the letter goes on, and according to international human rights law, the obligation to fulfil human rights means that states must take positive action to facilitate the, the enjoyment of basic human rights. And I think that is the crux of what the amendments that have been put down, that is the crux of the matter. That is what they're trying to achieve. That as we make law, that we are indeed facilitating the enjoyment of basic human rights, and that that is all human rights. So in conclusion, presiding officer, um, I believe that for very obvious reasons, there has not been and the obvious reason being the way in which the government is ramming this through this parliament with inadequate time for reflection, inadequate time for amendments to be properly considered, inadequate time for evidence to be gathered from, from all kinds of witnesses that have been thus far denied a voice in the procedure of this bill. I will give way to Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon. Yeah. Grateful to the member for giving way. Perhaps Stephen Kerr could um, explain to the Chamber in what circumstances he would support the bill. Um, because, you know, you're asking people to um, treat this in, in good faith, but I'm not convinced that Mr Kerr would ever support the bill. And I think it'd be better if he could just be clear on that. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. So, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm a realist and I can count and I know what lies ahead of us through the process of the consideration of these amendments. And at the end of the, at the, end of the stage three debate, you know, I'm not a political naivety in front of you here. And I know what I'm trying to do is do the very best I can. I think my colleagues here and in other places throughout this chamber are doing the same, are trying to introduce amendments that will make what we believe is bad law less bad. So am I going to vote for this bill? Absolutely not. But I know there's a very high likelihood 
that at the end of this process it's going to become the law of my country. And therefore, that is why uh, I and others are bringing forward these amendments. Not because we're going to support the bill, but because we just want to save Scotland from more bad law round through this Parliament. And that is why I, and I think freedom of religion and belief is, is an important aspect to, all, to many lives, because that includes, by the way, the right to not have a religion, not to have belief. But I believe that... Um, I'm happy to do so. Brian Whittle. Very grateful for my colleague for taking the intervention. It's just following um, Monica Lennon's intervention. I wonder if you would agree with me that what we, uh, as I said at the start of my contribution, I think every single member in this, this parliament recognises the need to develop uh, human rights across the board and that what we are trying to do here is ensure that the law that is made uh, does, not, does not impinge on other people's human rights and what we believe is that everybody should have the same right. We're not, I would vote for the bill if I believed that everybody had the same rights. Stephen King. Yes, and, and Brian Whittle, I think that gives us a brilliant summation of the views of many of us in this, in this chamber. I, I spoke earlier about the meeting that we had in Parliament, where there was, there was a very happy meeting of minds. People talked to each other and they listened to each other. And there was, in all of that, there was the basis for an accommodation that would give us exactly what Brian Whittle has just described as the desirable outcome that I hope we would all sign up to, which is that all of our human rights are being respected. And we respect each other enough to understand where my human rights and your human rights need to be accommodated. I'll give way. Douglas Lumsden. I thank the member. I thank the member for giving way. The outcome of that meeting, did the people go away thinking that the parliament would take note of their voices? Did they think there would be changes? Or were they assuming the worst? Stephen Kerr. <clears throat> no, no. In fact, they, they, as I said a few minutes ago, they left feeling that Foisal Chowdhury, who's in the chamber, and he can speak for himself, and maybe he's going to give a speech in a minute. Um, they felt that we had listened and that we were going to reflect their views when we had opportunities to speak in, in this chamber and in other places in this parliament. So they left with, um, with that hope, but they did plead with us that faith groups in this country would be more considered. Now, I just draw attention to the chamber, to the fact that through the pandemic emergency that we had, only one government in the United Kingdom was taken to court and found guilty of neglecting human rights. And that was the Scottish Government. In the Court of Session, they were found to have been in denial of the basic human rights defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, defined in the European Declaration of Human Rights, in respect to freedom of religion or belief. And one of, the, one of the aspects of that case was the degree to which there was a form of religious illiteracy among policymakers and advisors. And that is why I think it's important that we feel that we hear a fuller accounting from the Cabinet Secretary in response to this group of amendments on the whole subject area of freedom or of religion or belief. Uh, members of the Scottish Government may not be comfortable to be reminded that they were viol in violation of this fundamental human right through the pandemic. But it's a warning about the need for there to be care given in respect to any legislation that touches on this basic human right. And at the end of the day, I think, I hope what would unite all of us is a desire to ensure that Scotland remains on the right side of these fundamental human rights. Because I think that would be a source of pride to all of us. And that is why, in summation, I urge members, regardless of party, to vote for the amendments put forward, especially by Jeremy Balfour and Pam Gosell. And uh, I think that is the conclusion of my remarks.
Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I would, of course, just remind Stephen Kerr that it is his party and government that wants to repeal the human rights yeah. legislation yeah. that has protected people for many decades. Uh, moving back to the amendments uh, in this bill, I cannot uh, support Amendment 122, which provides that nothing in the bill affects the exercise of the Scottish Minister's functions in relation to prisons or prisoners. It's not clear what functions John Mason is referring to or how they could possibly be affected by the bill. And of course, the Sc uh, Scottish Prison Service has uh, already a robust risk based uh, procedure for uh, prisoners and of course the rest of their prison population and they may or may not place a, a trans person in the estate of their acquired gender whether or not they have a GRC and they, if they did put someone within that estate they may not uh, put them mixing with other prisoners. Yes, of course. Michelle Thompson. Yes. Secretary for giving way. I recall her saying earlier, and of course I'm aware of it myself, that the Scottish Prison Service are currently looking at the provisioning. So I suppose my question is, how does uh, the Cabinet Secretary know that they have a robust process that considers all key stakeholders, and particularly, as you know, my concern is women in prisons? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, SPS have given considerable evidence and their procedures are indeed very robust. The review is to look at what more they can do. But without a doubt, I think there is a, a level of confidence in SPS because of the fact that they do already place uh, transgender uh, prisoners out with their acquired gender in an estate that is not of their acquired gender if they think that is a risk. In fact, it's about half and half at the moment. Whether or not someone has a GRC, now I would just note that is quite different from the position in England and Wales where the possession of a GRC see is far more a material fact, factor in where a prisoner is located. That is not the case in Scotland. It is uh, based on the risk assessment and that is the primary issue that is uh, considered. And as I was just saying before the intervention that uh, even when someone is placed in the estate of their acquired gender, they may not be placed in a position of mixing with prisoners if, they, uh, if it's believed they are a risk to others. Uh, I cannot support Amendment uh, 57 in the name of Pam Gosell. As I believe was queried by Jamie Green at Stage 2, it's not clear uh, to me uh, whether Pam Gosell uh, expects all healthcare professionals to have to declare whether they are trans to every patient. Now, I'm sure she, uh, at the time when Jamie Green asked her, uh, the, the member, about that, that she said no, that was not uh, her intention. So let's look at what actually happens. The Charter of uh, Patients' Rights and Responsibilities rightly sets out that NHS staff have a, a right to be treated with consideration, dignity and respect. And as I set out to Pam Gosso when she brought this forward at stage two, the Scottish Government expects everyone to be treated fairly and equally and with respect when seeking health care. NHS staff will make every effort uh, to ensure that the privacy and dignity of all patients are maintained in Scottish hospitals. Uh, if a patient specifically requests a doctor or uh, nurse of the same gender as them in any part of their care, then every effort would be made to accommodate this as far as possible. But of course, that would depend on the availability of staff with appropriate skills to manage the patient's condition. If someone, for example, ends up in emergency care uh, and there's only male doctors available in the emergency room, then I'm sure in that situation members would appreciate that life-saving care needs to be given. Uh, whatever the, ag the gender of the health professionals attending. Yes. Pam Gosso. Thank you for taking that intervention, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm well aware of what you've just said in relation to if there was an emergency, our religions do provide that the fact that we have to have that care first. But if you go back to my practical example, it wasn't an emergency. It was to do day-to-day -day care, whether it's cancer, you know, um, inspection of the breasts, it was smear tests, so it's things like that that I'm talking about. And also, so sorry, if you could let me finish, Cabinet Secretary, please. Right, Cabinet Secretary, that basically looking at this, yes, we heard today that the case, that the, the 2004 Act 
that this was the case. But what I'm asking now is that are we going to continue on putting sticky plasters on this or are we going to actually address the problem? Because the increase in GRCs are going to cause a problem. And this is something that the Cabinet Secretary and her government would be able to help with us to see how we could solve this. Cabinet Secretary. So let, let me be absolutely clear again. If a patient specifically requests a doctor or nurse of the same gender as them in any part of their care, any part of their care, then every effort would be made to accommodate this as far as possible. And I've given the examples of where that might not be possible. No thanks. Care homes and care services, which were also mentioned, will always try to also provide the care as per the person's wishes. Uh, and as a former hair, uh, home care organiser, I can tell the Chamber that that has been the case for many years. The genuine occupation requirement exception under the Equality Act provides that a person must not uh, be a trans person where there is a requirement due to the nature and context of the work, if appropriate. The exception could be used in health services, for example, where there is intimate health and personal care to be provided. And, of course, I previously pointed towards the guidance to employers from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, Schedule 9 of the 2010 Act, which is relevant here. I want to uh, move... Uh, yes. Monica Lennon. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, when this debate is over, people may go back and, and read the official report of what was said. Um, I have felt uncomfortable with some things that have been said um, over the course of the debate. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me, and I'm sure others, that trans men and women and non-binary people who currently work in the NHS, in social care, are valued colleagues, and we don't want to leave this debate and anyone thinking that they're not valued and not welcome. So can we, can we get that for the avoidance of doubt? Because I think it's really, really important that their contribution is appreciated and that we want them to feel able to work in our public services. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely, I can put on record an appreciation of, of every member of staff working in our NHS and indeed our care services, whatever their, their gender. Uh, and I think uh, Monica Lennon makes a, a good uh, point. I, I can't uh, support the amendments in the name of Brian Whittle, uh, placing a duty on Scottish ministers to report on the impact of the bill on sport and to publish guidance. The bill makes no changes to the rules for trans participation in women's sport, whether professional, amateur or in schools. Sports governing bodies set their own policies on trans participation under the Equality Act 2010. That is reserved legislation. Section 195 of the Equality Act contains provision allowing restrictions on trans people participating in sport to be imposed, if necessary, to uphold fair competition or the safety of competitors. That is under the Equality Act. It, well, as long as it's brief. Brian Whittle. Oh, oh really? Well, Cameron said, what I'm trying to say to you is the guidance is not through working. Through the chair, Mr it's Whittle. Not... Through the chair, please. Sorry, Deputy Presiding Officer. Deputy Presiding Officer. It's not enough to have guidance. The guidance actually ha has to be applied and has to have worth in the field. And so many times through a lot of this debate here from many, many colleagues across here who have asked the government to, have gui to, to create guidance, the Scottish Government have to, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary have turned around and ignored that guidance. It isn't working, and, it's going, and obviously because there will be more trans uh, transgender athletes involved, it will get worse if you do not create the, the guidance and the framework for which uh, sport can act. And it's not a reserve matter. It's Sports Scotland, and you, you fund for Sports Scotland. You need to take responsibility for your actions. Cabinet Secretary. So let, let me repeat. Sports governing bodies set their own policies on trans participation under the Equality Act 2010, which is a reserved piece of legislation. Section 195 of the Equality Act, a reserved piece of legislation, contains provision allowing restrictions on trans people participating in sport to be imposed, if necessary, to uphold fair competition or the safety of competitors. That 
is where the resolution and the guidance lies. The Equalities Committee has heard clearly at stage one from sports bodies that whether a person has legally changed their gender forms, uh, gender forms no part of their decision making around participation in sport and the bill does not have an impact in this area. And as I hope the member would already be aware, in 2020, the UK Sports Council commissioned independent consultants to conduct a review of its existing guidance for the inclusion of transgender people in sport. The review was a recognition that sport at every level required more practical advice and support in this area. The UK Sports Councils published that guidance for transgender inclusion in domestic sport in September 2021, so just last year. Now, as the member himself acknowledged, sports are incredibly diverse and there may need to be different solutions for different sports, which is why the guidance encourages sports to consider options to balance fairness, safety and inclusion some British national governing bodies have now published updated policies. For example, British Triathlon have published a new policy to come into effect on the 1st of January. I don't support Amendments 13 and 14 in the name of Jeremy Balfour or Amendment 71 in the name of Ash Reagan. As both members will be aware, Acts of this Parliament cannot alter the effect of the European Convention on Human Rights, and therefore these amendments are unnecessary and indeed confusing, particularly in that they pick out specific parts of ECHR. On Stephen Kerr's point about religion, faith, uh, I had a, a meeting with the Faith and Belief Forum, uh, which has uh, faiths uh, ac across all faiths, uh, and of course there was a consultation responses from faith groups and also the committee uh, evidence sessions uh, with faith groups also uh, took uh, uh, place. So I don't think it's true to say that people of faith have not been listened to. And of course it's up to churches how they organise themselves and nothing in this bill changes that. The range of specific exceptions under the Equality Act that apply to faith groups, the general single-sex exception uh, could apply uh, to religious services where appropriate. So that's already covered within the Equality Act and there's no uh, change uh, to that whatsoever. I also don't support amendments 131 and 136 in the name of Tess White. The Scottish Government has carried out two public consultation exercises and the Equalities Committee has likewise carried out a full public consultation. I have also supported members with areas that they want to see outlined in the review and report amendments. So, On the basis of all of that, I would ask members to reject these amendments. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, I just remind the Chamber um, that there's a bit of background noise there. I'd be uh, grateful if you have conversations to be had that you take them outside the Chamber. With that, I invite John Mason uh, to wind up press a withdrawal amendment 122. Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I mean, first of all, can I just pay tribute to Sean Robinson for persisting through all of these hours and, uh, I have to say, a certain amount of delays from the Conservative uh, group. Um, so I admire her for that, even though I disagree with her on one or two points. Uh, if I start with Pam Gosell's speech, I thought that was excellent, and she gave us some practical examples of uh, where her mother and her aunt uh, really feel uh, there could be a practical problem. And I think sometimes with this debate, we have to look at what is happening to people in practice and what people are feeling, uh, and not just at a very kind of high-level Hollywood bubble uh, type of thing. And she herself mentioned the Muslim Council of Scotland. Eh, and we also know that Sikhs and a lot of Christians eh, are also very unhappy eh, about this bill. I, I think the point is, if we are going to be truly inclusive, eh, then we can't expect everyone to take on eh, the way we do things in Western secular society. And we have to allow people a certain amount of freedom eh, to exercise their own eh, way of doing things and their own beliefs. And I think that was, let me finish this point, I think that was highlighted uh, between the kind of intervention between Stephen Kerr and uh, Ross Greer, because Stephen Kerr would represent 
for most religions a more traditional view. Uh, Ross Greer might uh, represent a more liberal view, and that's probably where the divide is, more than between Christians and Muslims and Sikhs. Sorry, Rachel Hamilton wants Rachel to Rachel Hamilton. I thank John Mason for taking the intervention. Over the weekend, the Muslim Council of Scotland wrote to the Cabinet Secretary and said that they were concerned about the negative impact on single-sex spaces. But the Cabinet Secretary seems to be saying that she has engaged with faith organisations and everything's fine. But I don't understand how everything is fine if she has listened, the Cabinet Secretary has listened to the same arguments that were set in that letter to her on the weekend. Could you, John could Mace, you shed John some Mace. light? Yes, I mean, I did see the letter from the Muslim Council and also there was a joint letter between the Muslim Council, uh, the Sikhs in Scotland and the Evangelical Alliance, who do, between them, represent quite a range uh, of faith groups. So I think the, the fact that the, uh, Sean Robinson talked about there was no real change um, that may be her view of things, but it's not the way people are feeling about it, and people are not convinced about that. Uh, and there is a real concern. I think just to touch on uh, something my colleague Ash Reagan said earlier about legislation sending out a message. Uh, I, I know we can argue that this is a very technical piece of legislation, but I think a lot of people, including the faith groups and including uh, Pam Gosell's uh, relatives and so on, see this as much more of a longer... Well, let me just finish this point. They see this as much more of a longer-term trend, and they are fearful, maybe not about where we are today, but they are fearful about where we're going to be in a year's time. Uh, Kevin Stewart. Kevin Stewart. Um, I thank Mr Mason for giving way. Um, and, you know, I respect faith groups uh, of all kinds, and I respect freedom of religion. But some of the arguments that are being made are exactly the same arguments that were made on the run-up to the equal marriage debate and the equal marriage vote, where religious groups felt that they would have to carry out equal marriage against their faith. That has not happened, and my argument here would be that this is exactly the same kind of situation. Can Mr Mason see that? John Mason. Uh, I certainly understand Kevin Stewart's argument, but I would disagree with him because I think there is a, on same-sex marriage there is a drift, there is a change. Church of Scotland would be one example uh, where they were uh, somewhat more firmly against it and they have gradually uh, moved over time. So I think uh, that my argument that there is sorry, a Mr. drift... Sorry, Mr Mason. Uh, sorry? Could I, I've just reminded the Chamber that there had been too much background noise. The background noise has now become, I think, foreground noise and heckling. Um, we, I think I've conducted this proceeding so far respectfully uh, and courteously, and I would uh, hope that we can continue in a similar vein. Mr Mason. Um, so I would say that, that there has been a drift on that particular subject, and uh, I would say that some who believe in traditional values are feeling more under pressure they, than they were at that time. Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson. And I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. Just because a particular faith group changes its thoughts and its practice doesn't make that a bad thing. And describing that as drift, I, I would just caution him. It, it's a change, and it's, they're perfectly entitled to make that change. John Mason. Yes, they're perfectly entitled to, to make that change, but I, I think my point is just that some individuals are more under pressure now than they were in the past. And the fear with this legislation as well is that we are going in a certain direction, we are sending out a certain message, and it is going to become increasingly difficult for Pam Gosell's mother and Pam Gosell's aunt. Uh, to move on to, uh, just briefly, uh, Brian Whittle's uh, speech, which some of his points were good, they were a bit long-winded, but uh, <laughs> still um, good. And if, if that is true, that the... Um, committee did not take evidence from sportswomen, then I have a serious uh, problem with that. But I think the key words there, fairness and safety, uh, are absolutely key. And I take the, the issue on Robinson's point that the Equality Act is where people should look, but uh, a lot of Scottish, even national sports bodies in Scotland are relatively small, and they can be easily scared uh, by legislation if there's not a bit of guidance and reports. And really, I think that in that section 58, 59, 67, 68 is only asking for guidance and reports. It's not a very big ask. Finally, to come on to um, my own amendment, which was supported uh, by Kenneth Gibson in slightly more, perhaps, a stronger language than I was using, um, but did very much paint uh, some of the risks and some of the dangers and some of the fears that are out there amongst normal people uh, in society. I, I would just say language is very important and probably everybody here has been a bit uncomfortable at some of the language used by the other side. Uh, so I would certainly include uh, myself 
in that. Um, we should be sensitive and respectful, but I think, presiding officer, we have to be honest with each other and uh, use honest language. And I think one of the fears, again, with this legislation is that over time language is going to be censored and people are going to have to be increasingly careful about what they say. So, uh, overall, um, I would support, in fact, all the amendments uh, in this group. Uh, finally, I would just... Um, yes, I would, I'll leave it at that. Uh, all the amendments in this group, and especially I would press Amendment 122. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Mason. The question is that Amendment 122 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, the Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote's closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 122 in the name of John Mason is yes 59, no 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 57 in the name of Pam Gosell. Already debated with amendment 122. Pam Gosell to move or not move? To move. Thanks. The uh, question is therefore that amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There'll be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. <coughs> and the result of the vote on amendment number 57 in the name of Pam Gosell is yes 38, no 64. There were 23 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 58 in the name of Brian Whittle, already debated with Amendment 122. Brian Whittle to move or not to move? Move, please, Deputy President. The question Office. is that Amendment 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be another division and members should cast their votes now.
and the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number 58 in the name of Brian Whittle is yes 61, no 64. There was one abstention. The amendment is not agreed. Call amendment 59 in the name of Brian Whittle. Already debated with amendment 122. Brian Whittle to move or not move? Move, please. The question is that amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 59 in the name of Brian Whittle is yes 58, no 67. There was one abstention. That amendment is not agreed. Call Amendment 60 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. Question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Uh, members should cast their votes now. And the point, uh, that vote is closed. Point of order, Sharon Dowie. Sorry, I couldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Dowie. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on amendment number 60 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 122, no, zero. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore uh, agreed. Uh, the call amendment 61 in the name of Pam Gosal, already debated with uh, uh, amendment 54. Pam Gosal to move or not to move? Moved, please. Thank you. Question is that amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. A member should cast their votes now.
And the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment Number 61 in the name of Pam Gosal is yes, 40, no, 66. There were 20 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move on to Group 17, Gender Identity Healthcare. I call Amendment 62 in the name of Pam Gosal, grouped with Amendments 132 and 135. Um, Pam Gosal to move Amendment 62 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Ms Gosal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 62 in my name. The bill decouples the legal and medical aspects of the GRC process, meaning that everyone who, could, who, who would have had to obtain a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria and therefore meet with medical professionals now no longer have to do so. Amendment 62 calls on ministers to commission independent research on the effect of this bill on gender identity health care. In a submission to the committee, the Royal College of General Practitioners talked about the vulnerabilities of young people and the heightened risk of self-harm and suicide. When questioned on this by my colleague David Parker of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde said, the proposal to reform services is not simply about providing more clinic appointments and enabling pathways forward for people on the waiting list. It is also for people who will never join the waiting list so that community support is available for those people who might be looking for all kinds of intervention. If the numbers of people on the waiting list are increasing, that need is increasing too. Therefore, it appears that there are many people who may require this type of health care but do not seek it. This is likely to increase as the requirement to obtain a medical diagnosis is removed. We cannot risk individuals experiencing psychological distress by falling through these gaps. The aim of this amendment, presiding officer, is to measure what effect the Act has had on gender identity healthcare services. Who is assessing them? Who is not? And where can we provide that much-needed support for those who may be suffering from a great deal of distress? Furthermore, I believe this must be commissioned by an independent professional or organisation which is not currently in receipt of funding by the Scottish Government in order to avoid any instances of any bias. Given the nature of my own amendment, I therefore support amendments 132 and 135 put forward by Jamie Green and Sarah Boyack, which also aim to measure how this Act impacts gender identity health care. Should the Scottish Government wish to address concerns that this reform will lead to many vulnerable individuals suffering from gender distress without adequate medical support, at the very least, the Scottish Government should commit to reviewing the impact of this Act on gender identity health care. I would urge all members to back my amendment 62 in my name. Thank you, Ms Gosal. Um, I call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 132 and other amendments in the group. Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we persevere. Um, I, there's been a lot of talk uh, in the Chamber today, a quite valid discussion about the effect the Bill will have on a number of and a range of minority groups. And with permission of the Chamber, I'd like to bring the discussion back to the minority group that this Bill is actually all about, and that's trans people. Um, my Amendment 132 uh, actually builds on an amendment that was brought to the Chamber at Stage 2 in committee by my colleague Rachel Hamilton. I thought a very well-worded and thoughtful and well-intentioned uh, amendment to raise the awareness of the state of gender identity health care in Scotland. I believe it's in a sorry state, truth be told, and many trans people and organisations that I speak to believe that also to be true, which is the point, underlying point of my amendment. 
My amendment asks the government, within a reasonable time period, <coughs> after three years of Section 2 coming into force, there is some precedent for that reporting period, that the government will outline I, uh, the state of affairs with regards to access to mental health support and availability, transitioning healthcare waiting times, and whether bespoke pathway is needed for those applying for a GRC. Now, the reason for that, I think, is quite obvious to those who have been through that system. The Sandyford Clinic in Glasgow currently states that for their adult gender identity service, they are currently offering appointments to people in May 2018, uh, who registered in May 2018, only now getting appointments. It's taken four years for some people to get the required uh, treatment that they require. Um, yes, I'm happy to give away. Rachel Hamilton. To Jamie Green for taking the intervention. Um, he's absolutely right. Um, I uh, put forward this amendment at stage two, and it was um, rejected by the Cabinet Secretary because she described, she said that the Health Secretary was looking at a pathway to health care for trans people. And obviously, this bill is about Im improving the experience of trans people, particularly um, to make the whole process for them less stigmatised and uh, the rest of it, you know, just improve everything. But I think that this should be on the face of the bill. I don't think that we should um, leave it to uh, the health secretary, who's got enough pressures on his plate, um, to sort this out. I think this should be on the face of the bill. Because Ms it's Hamilton, really if you important. could address the microphone just yes. so that the comments are picked Thank up. Thank you. Sorry, presiding officer. Yeah, th can I thank, well, the member, can I thank the member for, for intervention? I, I, I too believe that, actually, uh, and, and with good reason. Um, the, the recent report from Stonewall, which I think the briefings that we've all received, uh, demonstrate that 72% of uh, transgender people have experienced depression, and over half, and listen to the statistic carefully, over half of people that they uh, surveyed have thought about taking their own life. That's a huge volume percentage of people. And I think these are quite harrowing figures that show the desperate state of the availability of mental health services and support <coughs> for transgender people in Scotland. Stonewall also found that 37%, so over a third, of trans people actually actively avoid accessing health care treatment when needed for fear of discrimination. Again, that should worry us. And what this means is that many people are actually hiding illnesses of their own while str struggling to deal with their gender identity. A great piece of work was done by SHAP, that's the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems. And in their recent report that came out very recently actually, and they were in the garden lobby talking to members, uh, who spoke to a number of trans people who were struggling with alcoholism. And I want to quote from that report because it, it really underpins the reason why I think this is an important issue. The person they spoke to said, on the record, for me, alcoholism means I'm not at ease with myself. And that might be a lot to do with being transgender and not being comfortable within my own skin. Growing up, having to hide things away like that, it was a lot of pressure. I've always been ashamed of who I am. We've held debates in this parliament before that uh, people uh, are often self-medicating to deal with many of those issues. And of course, whilst I support the removal and I do support the removal of the requirement for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. I do not think that that could, should be used as an excuse not to provide adequate services and support to tran transgender people uh, in Scotland. Now, I appreciate um, that in the feedback on all the amendments that were given to us in some of the briefs, some of the organisations, particularly those in support of the legislation, uh, whilst in principle were happy for me to raise this issue, they actually asked members to oppose the amendment uh, and I did inquire why, because I was intrigued by that. And their fear is that the amendment may have the reverse effect of improving health care, but actually doing the opposite. And the reason for that is quite understandably worrying. And that's because they feel that if this amendment passes, and there's a duty on the government and ministers to report on the state of health care, then it would divert much needed attention, resource and money from reporting and talking <coughs> rather than doing. And I think that itself is a testament to the problem that we face and the problem that I'm trying to identify uh, through this amendment. I understand where they come from, but they shouldn't need to be afraid that we can't put this on the face of the bill because those services should already be there and they should be getting better and they shouldn't be afraid 
for this Parliament to tell government that you must do better. So whilst I appreciate their, their feedback, um, it's a shame that their concerns are based around the lack of resource and money in these services. And I also hope they appreciate the sentiment behind why I brought them back to the Chamber at Stage 3. And I hope by doing so that I say to them that I will work hard, as other members will, to improve outcomes for them. That's a, a duty on all of us. And I would like to think that whatever your views on the bill, and there have been a number of comments uh, expressed this evening, which I think should make many of us feel uncomfortable. But whatever your views on this particular legislation, we can all agree that it is, there is a duty, a collective duty, on this Parliament to make healthcare provision for transgender people in Scotland much, much better than it is now. We can commit to that, whether you pass this amendment or not. That's something the government could commit to tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Green. Uh, under Rule 9.8.5a, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice to propose that the next time li limit be extended uh, by one hour and 30 minutes. Happy to do so, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the time limit by which the debate on Groups 17 to 19 must, be, uh, must end... Uh, must then be extended by one hour and 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. I now call Sarah Boyack to speak to Amendment 135 and other amendments in the group. Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'll try not to fill up an hour and a half with this speech. Um, this amendment um, that I'm moving, 135, would require Scottish ministers to carry out review into the impact of this bill into gender identity health care in the form of a longitudinal study. Scottish ministers would be required to consult in the remit of the review, but any review would have a focus on improving access to and provision of gender identity health care. The review would be pre uh, repeated each successive five-year period to deliver a longitudinal study. Um, the committee at stage one heard a range of evidence on the provision of trans health care, including on the CAST review, which is currently taking place in England. But a number of constituents I have engaged with over the Parliament's consideration of this bill would support work to improve gender identity health care in Scotland, because there are significant delays for trans people trying to receive treatment from clinics. And this bill could increase the number of people trying to act these access these services, which would exacerbate the demand on services that are currently provided. So the review I propose in this amendment would provide reassurances to Parliament that we don't forget individuals applying for a GRC who then go on to experience lengthy waiting periods for treatment they may wish to receive. I think when we pass legislation in this Parliament, we need a joined up approach to ensure it's successful. And at stage two, I moved amendments that would require ministers to publish data on trans healthcare waiting times. I welcome the reassurance I had from the Scottish Government, from the Minister, in the letter she sent me on the 9th of December, which outlined the fact that the Scottish Government is currently looking at work being done by Public Health Scotland to improve the quality of data on healthcare waiting times, as was committed to in the NHS Gender Identity Services Strategic Action Framework 2022-2024. to But I honestly believe we need more than that, because this bill will simplify the process to obtain a, to obtain a GRC. And there has been consideration on why the simplification is required. And it is possible, as the number of people applying for and obtaining a GRC increases, then we will see an increase in the number of people who need to and wish to access gender identity health care and potentially more complex needs. And this could be a direct impact of this bill. So I hope Parliament will agree to my amendment so we can ensure that health services deliver for the needs and demands of trans people both now and in the future. And, and finally, I've referenced the need for longitudinal health to be assessed. It's important that trans people get the support they need, not just in the earlier years of their transition on a short-term basis, but throughout their lives, so that this is not a one-off piece of work, but something which will need to be continued going forward, so that the health services we have in Scotland understand people's needs going forward. Um, so I move Amendment 135 in my name. If I can briefly just comment on the other two amendments. Um, amendment 62 in the name of Pam Gosal, I understand would require the Scottish Government to start a review similar to the cast review in Scotland. And I think that's something uh, we should support. And I would support this amendment if Pam Gosal moves it. Amendment 132 in the name of Jamie Green would require a review on the availability of trans health care three years after commencement. And given that that's aimed to ensure trans 
trans health care is available and meets the needs of trans people, I would support Amendment 132. And the point made by Jamie Green in moving his amendment, I think were very well made, because the delays and pressures people are experiencing are going to really impact on the experiences of people going forward. And I think we need to reflect on the statistics that he talked about in his speech. These amendments, I think, collectively would strengthen the impact of this bill, would make it more successful, and for those reasons, I hope colleagues will support them all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to respond. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, as I would uh, hope uh, the members who have amendments in this group are already aware, the Scottish Government published a strategic action framework for gender identity service improvement in December 2021, which set out a series of commitments that we are working to progress with NHS Scotland and other stakeholders with some investment uh, to make that happen. Uh, this included a commitment to Commission Public Health Scotland to provide regular publication of robust validated data on waiting times to access specialist clinical services. And that commission has been made and work is ongoing to deliver this by Public Health Scotland. Uh, we also made a commitment, uh, Sarah Boyett has just referred to, to make available funding for research into the long-term health outcomes of people accessing gender identity health care in Scotland. That process uh, is ongoing, led by the Chief Scientist's Office uh, within the Scottish Government's Health and Social Care Directorates, with a funding call issued to a sc a Scottish academic institutions uh, in August. Therefore, uh, much of what is thought, sought by the amendments in this group uh, have already uh, begun and are ongoing outside of the bill, which, of course, I would remind members is about the process and requirements for applying for legal gender recognition and not about access to and the delivery of gender identity uh, health care. Um, yes. Jamie Green. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's intervention. Look, the Cabinet Secretary knows I'm not, not trying to muddy the water with regards to the remit of the bill. That, that's been clear throughout my, my speaking over the last few days. But there is a valid point here. And that the point is now, under the existing volume of people going through the system and applying for GRC, there are years and years and years worth of waiting lists to get specialist help. If we pass the bill and that volume increases and there's an expectation that it will increase, then those waiting times are simply going to get longer and longer, unless the government puts more resource and cash into it. So that's why it's so important that the bill reflects that, because that will be an effect of the direct effect of the legislation that passes. Cabinet Secretary. So let, let me first of all recognise the point Jamie Green is, is making uh, about the, the waiting times and the need to make improvements. And that, of course, is why the Strategic Action uh, Framework uh, for Gender Identity Service Improvement was uh, published and the uh, investment uh, that is required to, to make those improvements. Now, uh, as Jamie Green knows, a, a GRC is not required in order to access gender identity health. Um, I think the, the data and the monitoring of the data will show whether or not uh, there is a, a, an increase uh, from uh, this legislation. I think uh, my, my f feeling is that there is not because it is about uh, people who are seeking uh, gender identity health care, whether or not they would be pursuing uh, a gender recognition certificate. Not everybody would want to do so, and not everybody who is wanting a, a gender recognition certificate would want to access health care. But I'll come on to the, 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 the data collection uh, in a second. So on the basis of, of all of that, I, I don't support uh, amendments 62, 132 and 135. I do recognise that these am amendments uh, may be motivated by a desire, as Jamie Green has just said, to improve the provision of gender identity uh, health uh, care services. Um, following discussions with members, we have, however, supported the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey to review the impact of the Act on gender identity health care already discussed in an earlier group. And I'm hoping that that will reassure members. And I think that gets the balance right. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I call on Pam Gosell to wind up press a withdrawal amendment 62. Ms Gosell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have heard throughout this debate about the need for the collection of data in other aspects which will undoubtedly be affected by this Bill, such as criminal justice, single-sex services and a review on its impact on the gender identity healthcare is no less important. 
I am disappointed, however, not surprised at the SNP Government's reluctance to review the Gender Identity Healthcare, as I imagine, much like the CAS review, it would provide a case for further pausing any reforms to the gender recognition process and shedding light on what appears to be a healthcare pathway which does not follow the routine medical process. I believe a review into the effect of this Act on gender identity healthcare will provide some reassurances for those who are concerned about the decoupling of the legal medical process. Come uh, Secretary. Just to be absolutely clear, the very last sentence that I just said in my remarks was that following discussions with Jackie Bailey, the, member, the, the amendment that we passed uh, or agreed to will review the impact of the Act on gender identity health care. It's exactly what she's, the member is asking for. Does she not recognise that? Pam Gosson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. But what I'm asking for is why are you not then go, uh, passing this, this grouping that we've asked for? Anyway, the SNP's government removal of all safeguards increases the likelihood that children, young people and vulnerable individuals may go without much needed support. And therefore, I would urge all members to back the amendments in this group. Thank you. Ms Gosell, you're pressing the amendment. Ms Gosell? Ms. Gosell, oh, you're pressing. Yes, I move. Thank you. The question is Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. A vote on Mr. Lumsden. And the vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on Amendment 62 in the name of Pam Gosell is yes. 54, no 68. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 123 in the name of Pam Gosell. Already debated with amendment 54. Pam Gosell to move or not move? Moved, please. Question is that amendment 123 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. <coughs> it 
The result of the vote on Amendment 123 in the name of Pam Gosal is yes, 36, no, 67. There were 22 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. With that, we move to Group 18, reporting. I call Amendment 124 in the name of Rachel Hamilton. Group with Amendment 63, 64, 65, 125 and 66. Rachel Hamilton to move Amendment 124 and speak to all other amendments in the group. Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and move the amendment in my name. Uh, my first amendment in this group would shorten the time period in which the Register General would be required to report on the information mentioned in subsection 5. Given the evidence that this bill will open up the possibility of obtaining a GRC to a much larger and wider and diverse group of people, I believe it is important that the impact of this is assessed more regularly than one year. Moreover, as set out in Amendment 125, the scope of the Register-General's duty to report should be expanded to include the number of applications for gender recognition certificates and confirmatory gender recognition certificates that are rejected. The number of applicants under the age of 18, the number of gender recognition certificates granted to applicants under the age of 18, and the number of applications for gender recognition certificates and confirmatory gender recognition certificates where the acquired gender is male or female. Gaining clarity around the effect of this legislation would be aided by ensuring the Register General collects this data. Painting a clear picture of the number of applicants and the number of applications granted on a six monthly basis would allow us to apply a greater level of post legislative <laughs> scrutiny to this bill. The importance of doing so relates to evidence heard by the committee that this bill would lead to an uptake in the number of individuals applying for and obtaining a GRC. We must also uh, um, ensure the impact of opening this process to 16 and 17 year olds is properly assessed and that is why I have included provisions for the Register General to report on the number of people who apply for and obtain a GRC under the age of 18. I would find it difficult to believe that choosing not to require the Register General to report on these matters would be in any way beneficial. For these amendments, I, uh, and, and for these reasons, I also believe Pam Duncan Glancy's amendments in this group 63 to 66 are necessary to further our understanding of the effects of this bill. And she will do a far better job, I'm sure, of explaining the purpose and effect of her amendments than than I will, but my understanding is that they will require the Register General to collect data on several important factors, including the number of GRC applications rejected by the Register General. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. I call Pam Duncan Glancy to speak to Amendment 63 uh, and other amendments in the group. Ms. Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, members will know that I brought a similar amendment at stage two. Between then and now, I have worked with the government because I believe it is essential that we gather data in relation to this bill. And on that basis, I hope to have their support for my amendments tonight. And I welcome support offered from Rachel Hamilton a moment ago. Amendment 63 to 66 in my name strengthened data collection requirements in the bill. In addition to the data outlined in the amendments, I have also sought assurances that other data originally included in my amendment at stage two would be collected as well. I have had assurances from the government that this will indeed be the case and would appreciate further reassurance again tonight on the record. This includes data on the number of appeals to the Sheriff and the grounds under which applications to the Sheriff were received or granted. The government have confirmed that data of this sort is held by the Scottish Courts rather than NRS and that the Scottish Government already publishes statistics on civil law cases in the courts. I also ask that applications received from people in prison be monitored. Because of the low numbers, I accept that this could identify an individual, and I'm satisfied that this will be monitored and reported on in terms of the review and impact already, uh, amendments already debated. Between these assurances, which I seek again, as I say, I'm satisfied that the rel relevant data needed to inf reform, inform reviews that are required in other amendments will be available. The remaining information and data that is needed is set out in the amendments before us tonight. These introduce additional reporting requirements for the Registrar General, including the number of applications of each type of GRC granted, rejected or withdrawn in the year, and breakdowns of applications by type and application and gender of applicants. The collection of better data on GRCs will be of a paramount importance to any future reviews of this Act and for monitoring purposes. 
Supporting these amendments in my name will ensure that, this, that Scotland will start with a strong evidence base from which to carry out any future scrutiny, monitoring, reporting and reviewing of this bill. Presiding officer, I therefore move the amendments in my name and encourage members to support them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I call Jamie Green. I think it's just briefly to say that I think these are a good set of amendments, uh, particularly that uh, around Amendment 64 or 65. Um, one of the things we really struggle with throughout this process is, is gleaning data on, on statistical numbers of the amount of people that are currently applying or have been rejected a certificate. That historic data, I, I've tried to put in a number of parliamentary questions around that. And I was told that because of the volume is low, it's difficult to get that data because it would potentially breach the confidentiality of those that are involved. Now, it's not something I particularly buy. Um, I think that um, data is important. It doesn't need to have names, addresses and faces attached to it, but that data will help inform public policy. We also have enhanced data that may arise from census data, uh, uh, whilst um, that wasn't the most perfect exercise in the world as we saw, but it is nonetheless helpful to inform public policies. And I would ask members that even if they are generally not supportive of the legislation to at least uh, allow the collection of valuable data to help inform future public policy to be collected. Thank you, Mr Green. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I said to Pam Duncan Glancy at stage two that I would be happy to consider what could be incorporated from her Amendment 147 that was not agreed to at stage two. And I'm pleased, therefore, we have been able to work together to bring forward the amendments uh, in uh, her name. And I'm happy to give her uh, the assurances that she was looking for, because I think the point being that some of the information that is collected uh, is from sources out with the Registrar General, but we gave a commitment to collect that, and I can put that on the record uh, again. Uh, we agree there that there is benefit in including more detail in the, the duty to report to provide assurance to members of the information that will likely be available. This information will contribute to our understanding of the operation of the process and ability to monitor and review the impact of this bill, as with any other. Amendment 124, in the name of Rachel Hamilton, provides that the Registrar General must report every six months instead of annually on everything for which reporting is presently done under the Registration of Births, Deaths and Marriages, Scotland Act 1965, not just information related to gender recognition, and we believe that is disproportionate. Amendment 125, in the name of Rachel Hamilton, requires the Registrar General to report on the number of applications rejected on the acquired gender and the age of applicants. And as we expect the Registrar General to receive between 250 and 300 applications per year, requiring the Registrar General to report every six months reduces the likelihood that the information will be, be able to be published, given the, the small numbers and the risk of identifying an individual. Uh, further, the amendments in the name of Pan Duncan Glancy already include a requirement to report on the number of applications rejected and on the acquired gender. Therefore, I do not support amendments 124 and 125. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Rachel Hamilton to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 124. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the concerns that have been raised by members of this Parliament, by organisations and individuals, who gave evidence in our committee sessions and by a swathe of Scottish public about this legislation, I believe it is right that we can do what we can here to monitor uh, robustly the impact of it. Ensuring that the Register General regularly reports on the information outlined is an important step in allowing us as elected representatives and anyone else to see and understand the outcomes related to the Bill's implementation. And as I said before, it is difficult to consider how choosing not to collect this data would be beneficial. Understanding the consequences of new legislation is a vital part of applying adequate post-legislative scrutiny. And although this SNP and Green Party has throughout this process sought to avoid scrutiny in any form, these amendments represent an opportunity for them to put this right and commit to that very action. Um, uh, the Cabinet Secretary didn't explicitly say that she wasn't going to support... I didn't hear her say she wasn't going to support 124, but I know that she's not going to support 125, so presuming that she's not supporting either. Um, I'd just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, before I close, how does she know how many applications of um, gender recognition certificates there are going to be? How does she know how many... Um, 
how many GLCs there will be and indeed how this, the impact will, we, will have on this Parliament. Sorry, I couldn't get my words um, I, I think uh, Rachel Hamilton is giving way to the Cabinet Secretary. Is that correct? Uh, Cabinet so Secretary. we've based the numbers of 250 to 300 applications per year on the Irish system, which we consider to be very similar to our own. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you for the Cabinet Secretary um, for clarifying that. But every... Um, every uh, jurisdiction has a different system and it's not exactly the same as the system that we are going to be voting on today. So um, that's slightly unfair to, to pick that as one example. And uh, I, I'm just disappointed. Uh, I will um, move the amendment. Can we have less sedentary chit-chat? I will move the amendment in my name. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Point of order, Rhoda Grant. I stopped working after I voted, and I want to check if I voted. Uh, your vote had not been recorded, but it will now be recorded. Could Thank I vote you, no, no, please? You voted no. Thank you, Ms. Grant. <laughs> Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 124 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 30, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 63 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 124. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed, uh, therefore there will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Uh, Kenneth Gibson, uh, point I was unable to go onto the app. I, I would have voted yes. Point of order. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. That will be recorded. Uh, point of order. Colin Beatty. Colin Beatty. Uh, President Officer, uh, my, my system didn't connect. I, I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Beatty. That will be recorded.
Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 63 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 123. Uh, there were no votes against. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The question I call Amendment 64 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy already debated with Amendment 124. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? It moved, President Nelson. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 64 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 121. There were no votes against. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 124. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Uh, the question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast a vote now. The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 65 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 122. There were no votes against. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 125 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 124. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now.
The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 125 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes, 36, no, 90. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment number 66 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 124. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? It moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 66 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes, 122. There were no votes against. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment number 67 in the name of Brian Whittle, already debated with amendment 122. Brian Whittle, to move or not move? Moved, please. Thank you. The question is that amendment 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Uh, point of order, Mary McAllen. Thank you. Uh, my app froze. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms McAllen. That will be recorded. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 67 in the name of Brian Whittle is yes, 55, no, 69. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment number 68 in the name of Brian Whittle, already debated with amendment 122. Brian Whittle to move or not move? Move, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Members should cast their vote now.
vote is now closed. Uh, point of order, Colin Beattie. Then, officer, my app froze. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr. Beattie. That will be recorded. Uh, point of order, Jeremy Balfour. I just wanted to check my phone is just frozen whether my vote was counted or not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Balfour. Your vote was counted. Thank you. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 68 in the name of Brian Whittle is yes, 58, no, 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We will now move to Group 19 on data collection. I call Amendment 69 in the name of Pam Gozo, grouped with Amendments 70 and 126. Pam Gozo to move Amendment 69 and speak to all amendments in the group. Ms Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As this is the final grouping, I will try to deliver to the best of my ability, bearing in mind it is nearly midnight and I am slightly just feeling tired now. I move amendments 69 and 70 in my name. Data collection is key to understanding and analysing the impact of this Act. As was made clear by the United Nations Special Rapporteur, Reem Asalim, in evidence given to the committee, data collection on the impact of the self-identification model does not go far enough. Amendment 69 called on ministers to collect data on detransitioners. Detransitioners are people who have gone through the process of changing their gender and then returning to the gender observed at birth. Specifically, my amendment calls on ministers to collect data on the number of people that detransition. How many of these detransitioners are male to female, how many are female to male, and the average time elapsing from being granted a GRC to beginning to detransition. Last month, many of us in this room attended a meeting arranged by the member Ruth Maguire with two detransitioners, Sinead and Ritchie who bravely shared their experience of detransitioning of transitioning sorry and then detransitioning which was extremely powerful and very heartbreaking yeah. Sinead's transition from a female to a male left her with permanent changes such as a deep voice while Richie who had transitioned from a male to a female underwent gender reassignment surgery which he later ended up regretting. Both individuals also expressed concern over the lack of data on detransitioners. The pair went into great detail about the lack of support available for detransitioners, speaking of how different the support was when seeking to transition versus detransition. They also spoke about how Gaining legal recognition of your gender identity is likely to lead you to feel that pressure to align your physical gender identity leading to irreversible changes. Richie even spoke of the health complications he has suffered from since undergoing medical transition. Since this bill removes important safeguards such as lowering the age one can apply for a GRC from 18 to 16 years old and shortens the two-year waiting period to three months for adults and six months for those under the age of 18. Many young people and vulnerable individuals risk making rushed decisions they might later end up regretting and without adequate support. This amendment seeks to ensure that data is collected on individuals who detransition. Only with that data can we expect to understand the extent to which individuals detransition. Such information would be crucial to informing any review of the gender recognition process and informing any review on gender identity health care. Amendment 70 also calls 
for some more data collection, this time regarding acquired gender and sex at birth in certain settings such as healthcare and criminal justice. For example, it will be important to know how many GRC holders work in healthcare settings and in prisons, as women in these settings can be a vulnerable population. But without collecting specific data on acquired gender and biological sex, it is nearly impossible to know this. Professor Alice Sullivan told the committee, we need consistent and accurate data on sex to make comparisons over time and between countries and to evaluate the effect of policy interventions. She then said, when the Gender Recognition Act 2004 was introduced, it was designed to cater to a tiny number of transsexual people who suffered from severe psychological distress. The Act was not intended to raise barriers to the collection of data on sex, yet that has been one of the unintended consequences of the legislation. Therefore, I believe it would be in the interests of trans people with a GRC and the wider public for the Scottish Government to collect data on both sex, gender identity and gender recognition certificates if we are to understand the impact of this legislation and accurately track the outcomes of people in society. My amendments refer specifically to healthcare settings and criminal justice because both include large numbers of vulnerable individuals under the state's care and therefore it is important that data is collected in these settings. Speaking to the committee on Monday, the United Nations independent expert on sexual oriental and gender identity, Victor Madrigal Borlaws, mentioned that previously no one knew about violence against transgender people because they were, because they were being recorded as men. However, I believe that given that conflation of data collection, both sex and gender identity, and a substantial increase expected in the number of people holding GRCs, it is important that we do not conflate these terms for the purpose of data collection. Otherwise, instead of trans women being recorded as men, they will be recorded as women. And we will still lack data on violence against trans people. Data collection is the least that can be done to monitor the impact of this bill. So I hope that members will support my amendments in this group. I will support Stephanie Callaghan's Amendment 126, which also calls for more data collection in public sector settings and on biological sex and gender regarding the number of those holding a GRC. Thank you, Ms Gozo. I now call on Stephanie Callaghan to speak to Amendment 126 and other amendments in the group. Ms Callaghan. Thank you, President Officer, and I move <coughs> Amendment 126 in my name. My amendment is a very simple one that places a duty on the Scottish Government to ensure all public sector bodies collect data on biological sex alongside data on gender identity. And this amendment is not designed to frustrate, challenge or place onerous demands on the Scottish Government and public bodies. It is purely about ensuring access to clear, accurate baseline data on both biological sex and gender identity now and in the future. Throughout this amendment stage and during committee evidence sessions, we have heard opposing views on pretty much every issue, but I think it is fair to say that the value of good data is something we can all agree on. Therefore, I am proposing that Scotland's public bodies routinely and as a duty collect, retain and report quantitative data on biological sex including all administrative and in-service process data, in addition to legal sex gender identity. President officer, data is an essential tool for health and wellbeing. And we already know that many medicines we use today affect male and female bodies differently. However, we also need good data for diseases and medicines that we don't yet know about. Researchers have found that missing data in patients on sex and gender has meant there is no accurate data on whether trans and non-binary people were, for example, more or less affected by COVID-19. Yes, I will. Tess White. Thank, thank you to Stephanie Callaghan for, for taking an intervention. Um, does the member think that a public board 
that's 50% men and 50% trans, transgender women, women is um, gender balanced. Uh, Stephanie Callaghan. I don't really see where that's particularly relevant to this one, but I was actually agree. Now, some may argue that this is just a matter of personal choice. If a transgender person wants to change their sex on their medical records, even with those associated risks, then that is their choice. But are people receiving the best advice for their health? There are count countless reports of people missing cancer screenings and experiencing delays in receiving care. The importance of longitudinal data is a fundamental principle for researchers and healthcare professionals that allows them to understand people's lives over time and improve services for all people. While some will say there is no reason this legi the legislation that we're considering would affect data collection, Professor Sullivan told the committee that would be an understandable assumption, but it would be a mistake. The professor went on to say, when the Gender Recognition Act 2004 was introduced, it was designed to cater to a tiny number of transsexual people who suffered from severe psychological distress. The Act was not intended to raise barriers to the collection of data on sex, yet that has been one of the unintended consequences of the legislation. On, on that point, would you give way? Yes, I will. Uh, Michelle Thompson. Uh, thank you for giving way. Can I also draw our attention to, uh, in February 2021, 91 quantitative social science scientists wrote to Scotland's chief statistician to express concern about the proposed loss of data on sex. And they said, and I quote, we find a conclusion that sex-based data should rarely be collected astonishing Sex is a fundamental demographic variable essential for projections regarding fertility and life expectancy. They went on to f finish part of their paragraph by quoting Caroline Criado Perez. A lack of sex disaggregated data often leads to the needs of women and girls being ignored. Yeah. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the member for that intervention and, and certainly I welcome the sharing of that information. I believe there was also a letter to the, the Health Committee as well. So, in closing, President Officer, I, I would remind the Scottish Government of its public sector equality duty to monitor and publish data on the protected characteristics of sex and point out that mandating the collection of this data across public bodies now is likely to save future governments and parliaments a lot of time and trouble. President Officer, urge members to support Amendment 216. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Callaghan. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Amendment uh, 69 in the name of Pam uh, Gosal would place a duty on Scottish ministers to collect and publish information about people who detransition. We have supported an amendment in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy that includes more detail within the Registrar General's reporting duties of the information that will likely be available. And this includes the number of applications uh, withdrawn. Given that we expect the Registrar General to receive between 250 and 300 applications per year, there are data protection considerations involving uh, in amending this provision to uh, be uh, more prescriptive because information will only be available where it does not risk disclosing the identity of an individual where there's very small numbers. Amendment 70 in the name of Pam Gosal and 126 from Stephanie Callaghan place a duty on Scottish ministers to set out in regulations the data that is required to be collected in order to monitor the operation and impact of the bill. Amendment 70 already debated regarding the post-legislative review ensures Scottish ministers must have regard <coughs> excuse me, to any data provided to them about the effect of a person obtaining a gender recognition certificate under the 2004 Act as amended. The amendments agreed in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy also set out more detail about the data that will likely be available from the National Records of Scotland. This information will contribute to our understanding of the operation of the process and the ability to monitor and review the impact of the bill. As that has already been agreed and provided for in the bill, I see uh, no added value in amendments 70 and 126, and therefore I cannot support them. Thank you. I call Pam Gosal to wind up and press or withdraw amendment 69. 
thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm disappointed once again that the Cabinet Secretary isn't accepting the amendments in this grouping. I think that what I've asked for goes further and that I would basically like that the Cabinet Secretary would have supported my amendments on detransitioning and obviously collecting the data. So I do urge that members here today do support and back my uh, amendments in this group and the other amendment. So I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 69 in the name of Pam Gosson is yes 55, no 70. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. <coughs> I call amendment 70 in the name of Pam Gossel, already debated with amendment 69. Pam Gossel to move or not move? Move, please. Thank you. The question is that amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 70 in the name of Pam Gossel is yes 53, no 71. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 126 in the name of Stephanie Callaghan, already debated with amendment 69. Stephanie Callaghan, to move or not move? Move, please. The question is that amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now.
vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 126 in the name of Stephanie Callaghan is yes 58, no 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 72 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with amendment 54. Sue Webber, to move or not move? To move, please, presiding officer. The question is that amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 72 in the name of Sue Webber is yes 32, no 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 73 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 54. Sue Webber to move or not move? To move, please, Presiding Officer. The question is that Amendment 73 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 73 in the name of Sue Webber is yes 54, no 72. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 74 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 54. Sue Webber, to move or not move? I'll move my amendment, please, Presiding Officer. The question is that Amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 74 in the name of Sue Webber is yes 54, no 72. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 127 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 54. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 127 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes 54, no 68. There were five abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 128 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 54. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 128 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes 58, no 67. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 129 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 54. Pauline McNeill, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 129 in the name of Pauline McNeill is yes, 59, no, 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 130 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 54. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 130 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> Colin Beattie for a point of order. My app didn't collect, connect. I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 130 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 60, no, 66. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 13 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 122. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, move, please, President Officer. The question is that amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 13 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes, 62, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 14 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 122. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, move, please, President Officer. The question is that amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, and members should cast their votes now.
vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 14 in the name of Jeremy Balfour is yes 59, no 68. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 71 in the name of Ash Regan, already debated with amendment 122. Ash Regan to move or not move? Oh, sorry, moved. <laughs> the question is that amendment 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 71 in the name of Ash Reagan is yes 64, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call, thank you. I call amendment 131 in the name of Tess White, already debated with amendment 122. Tess White to move or not move? Moved, presiding officer. The question is that amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 131 in the name of Tess White is yes 53, no 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 132 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 62. Jamie Green to move or not move? Uh, bear with me, presiding officer. Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 132 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. Point of order, Jeremy Valfort. Uh, the system wouldn't load. I would have voted yes to the amendment. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 132 in the name of Jamie Green is yes 54, no 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 133 in the name of, ja in the name of Jamie Green already debated with amendment 54. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that amendment 133 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 133 in the name of Jamie Green is yes, 53, no, 73. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 75 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Can I just confirm, are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the 
The result of the vote on amendment number 75 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 120, no, 5. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 76 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. I call amendment 76A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with amendment 56. Pam Duncan Glancy, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 76A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 76A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 54, no 69. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Jackie Bailey to press or withdraw amendment 76. Press. The question is that amendment 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 76 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 123, no two. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 77 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 77 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 77 in the name of Jackie Bailey is 124. There was no one, two abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 78 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My, my app would not connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 78 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 124, one, no, zero. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Yes. I call amendment 79 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 79 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> Parliament is not. Parliament is not agreed, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Murdo Fraser. I'm connecting, presiding officer. Again, I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 79 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, one, two, five. No, zero. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I, no. I call amendment 80 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 80 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 80 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 125, no, zero. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 81 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 81 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 81 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 125, no, zero. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 82 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 50. Okay, can I? I believe there was a no to 82, but I will require members to make sure that I can hear them. And I would ask anyone who is uh, wishing to, to vote to, to make that quite loud. Um, the question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 82 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 124, no, 1. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 83 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. I call Amendment 83A in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 56. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 83A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed, and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 83A in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 53, no, 73. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Jackie Bailey to press or withdraw amendment 83. Press. The question is that amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 83 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 125, no, zero. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 84 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. I call amendment 84A in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment 56. Pauline not moved. Thank you. It's not moved. Jackie Bailey to press or withdraw amendment 84. Press. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that amendment 84 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 84 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 125. There were no votes against and there were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. That was 84. I call amendment 85 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 85 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
the vote is closed. Point of order, Jamie Green. I would have voted yes. Thank you. I'll ensure that's recorded. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 85 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 120. There were no votes against. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 86 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 86 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote's closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 86 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 124. There were no votes against. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 87 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Already debated with Amendment 56, Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 87 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 87 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 124. There were no votes against. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 88 in the name of Ruth Maguire, already debated with Amendment 56. Ruth Maguire, to move or not move? Not move, to proceeding off. Thank you. I call Amendment 89 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? Moved. I call Amendment 90A in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy, already debated with Amendment 56. Pam Duncan Glancy to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 90A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. 
Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Christine Graham for a point of order. My connection, I would have voted no. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Colin Beatty for a point of order. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 98 in the name of Pam Duncan Glancy is yes 52, no 71. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Jackie Bailey to press or withdraw amendment 90. Press. The question is that amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Sharon Dowie. Connect, I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 90 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 124. There were no votes against. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 134 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with amendment 56. Russell Finlay, to move or not move? Move, please. The question is that amendment 134 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 134 in the name of Russell Finlay is yes, 54, no, 70. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 135 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 62. Sarah Boyack to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 135 in the name of Sarah Boyack is yes, 54, no, 73. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 91 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 56. Jackie Bailey to move or not move? For the last time, Presiding Officer, moved. The question is that Amendment 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Kenneth Gibson. Uh, I couldn't connect to the digital platform. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 91 in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 123. There were no votes against. There were three abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 92 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with amendment 54. Sue Webber, to move or not move? Uh, move, please. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 92 in the name of Sue Webber is yes 37, no 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 136 in the name of Tess White, already debated with amendment 122. Tess White to move. Or moved, not thank move. you. The question is that amendment 136 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 136 in the name of Tess White is yes 32, no 95. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 141 in the name of Michael Mara, already debated with amendment 100. Michael Mara to move or not move? President officer, this was a technical amendment uh, tied to a previous amendment that's already fallen. I won't be moving and anyone who does move it will be spuriously wasting parliamentary time and frankly ruining Christmas. <laughs> Amendment 137 in the name of Rachel Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 95. Rachel Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 137 in the name of Rachel Hamilton is yes 34, no 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 138 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with amendment 108. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
I call Amendment 139 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 108. Jamie Green to move or not move. Training officer, I have the great privilege of moving the last amendment of the evening. Hopefully it will provide some much needed consensus in the debate. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Yes. That, that ends consideration of amendments. At this point in the proceedings, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the Bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this Bill, in my view, no provision of the Gender Recognition Reform Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. The next item of business, point of order, Douglas Ross. I am grateful, uh, Presiding Officer. When this meeting started uh, yesterday lunchtime, I raised the issue uh, about comments made uh, in this chamber by myself uh, on Tuesday, which were not recorded uh, in the official record. I wonder, uh, in the intervening 12 hours, if you have had the opportunity to look at that and if you are able to update Parliament on the reason why, when the microphones were working, there seems to be no audio, video or written record of what was said in the Chamber uh, and what efforts can be made to correct that. Um, thank you, Mr Ross. Um, as you will appreciate, we have had a, a very busy parliamentary day. As I said earlier this morning, my understanding was that the meeting was suspended at that point. I have confirmed to Mr Ross earlier that I will look into the matter and as soon as I have done so, I will respond to Mr Ross. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 7367 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business. I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. I call on Alexander Burnett to speak to and move Amendment 7367.1. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, whilst I can only commend the hard work of the parliamentary staff, it has been a sorry couple of days for this Parliament. The lengths that the SNP have gone to to force through this gender bill by Christmas has well and truly crossed a line. This is not emergency legislation. There was no requirement for everything else to be put aside. There was no need to force parents of young children to worry about finding childcare at ridiculous hours and very short notice. Absolutely. There was no good reason for carers or cared for people to have had to change their plans on a whim to suit the government's timetable Absolutely. or to have their concerns branded irrelevant by SNP MP, MSPs. Members, supporters members, of the bill. Members, can we please ensure that we can hear Mr. Burnett? Thank you. Thank you. Supporters of the bill from all parties have highlighted that the rush timetable has made engaging with the detail of the bill unnecessarily difficult for them. We could have quite easily avoided this by scheduling numerous sessions to consider stage two and three amendments, including in the new year, so that scrutiny could be maximised and the rights and well-being of MSPs and staff could have been respected. To the shame of this Parliament, that, re that reasonable option was kicked aside in favour of political gain for the SNP, or should I say, the avoidance of political loss. Yeah. The proposed business motion seeks to make one final effort to force a vote on the Gender Bill before Christmas. And yet, so much has changed over the course of Stage 3. We have seen a court of session ruling after the amendment deadline had passed, meaning Parliament has had no opportunity to consider how this might affect the Bill. Time must be taken to consider these things properly. And, Presiding Officer, there is so much other crucial business that does need to be debated before we head into recess. Not least following yesterday morning news that Scottish NHS workers intend to strike. This is a true crisis 
facing Scotland's NHS and is the exact type of issue the people of Scotland actually want Parliament to be prioritising before yep. Christmas. My colleague Stephen Kerr has asked for a much needed statement on the Curriculum for Excellent Achievement statistics. Education was once brandished by the SNP as their top priority. Clearly not anymore. Therefore, my amendment inserts statements on the NHS strikes and the education statistics. And whilst I welcome Labour's backing of these Conservatives' calls for statements, I wish to say this. The rush of GRR is possibly the most serious disrespect the Scottish Parliament has ever seen. And if Labour share our wish to have these statements, they should vote for our amendment, because it removes the final debate on the GRR bill from tomorrow's programme with a view to a final vote in the new year. And before the Minister stands up and gives his faux outrage at who he believes is to blame for his own government's timetable, I would draw the Chamber's attention to the business programme for the week we returned from recess. And as I stated yesterday, there was a debate slot on the afternoon of Tuesday the 10th of January that had yet to be allocated. And we propose moving the final debate on GRR to that slot with further amendment consideration tomorrow to avoid the situation that we have found ourselves in the last two nights. And to be clear, that would still be our preference as per my amendment. Well, I can reveal to the Chamber that as of 20 to 8 this evening, that slot has now been filled. Filled with the Government's first and only priority. Yes, the Minister has confirmed he seeks to fill it with a debate on independence. Surprising, surprising. Thank you, members. Members, let us hear Mr oh, Burnett, please. Of course he has. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move amendment 7367.2. Thanks, President Officer. I'll be very brief. We do support there being statements tomorrow on NHS strikes and educational attainment. But I'll say to Alexander Burnett, no, we won't support your amendment. We'll support our own amendment, which inserts both of those statements tomorrow alongside stage three of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. I move the amendment in my name, President Officer. Thank you. I call on George Adam to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, Presiding Officer, uh, Alexander Burnett, obviously, God loves a child. At 20 past one, nobody's watching, Mr Burnett. Nobody is watching at this stage, but still they feel they have to showboat and continue. You know, the only problem this week, presiding officer, I've sat during our numerous, our numerous uh, meetings that we've had at Bureau, and I've sat very quietly and watched the business go by and said my piece when I've had to uh, and actually go on. But what I have noticed during that period is Bureau working as Bureau should, when you've had actually three political parties working with one another, discussing, having different policies and different beliefs, but still being able to work with each other to ensure that we can deliver the business of Parliament. And that is exactly what the Parliamentary Bureau is for. But the only disrespect, the only disrespect that's come during this period has been from the Conservative Party. Yeah. As they... As they... As I have said on numerous occasions at the meetings, as they have used every dirty trick in the book to try and ensure that... Minister, Minister, oh. Minister, let's ensure that our language is always courteous. Point of order, Stephen Incidentally, Kerr. My point of order is in relation to the use of the term dirty tricks. I think you may have already dealt it with it since. Well, we have... Can I just confirm... Everything that we have done in this Parliament in the last few days is in order according to the standing orders. Can the presiding officer just confirm that that is the case? I can confirm that and of course myself and the deputy presiding officers would always ensure that that is the case, Mr Kerr. Um, Minister. Presiding officer, presiding officer, perhaps dirty tricks was a bit of hyperbole in my part. Probably better to say that they have used every single reason to slow down business of this Parliament over the last number of days. And that, and that to me, shows a disrespect, presiding officer, to you, 
the people who work in this building and also the people that have followed Members, the let us hear the Minister. Thank you. So that was the disrespect shown by the Conservative. I hope in the new year, when people come back and we sit there at our new bureau in the new year, that uh, the Conservative Party do better and actually do want to work with us all and do the job. Now, to my, our Labour colleagues, can I say we have worked together over this period. There have been many statements over the last couple of weeks where we have agreed that we would actually do that. And anything else that they've wanted to do, then they can add and in the usual manner. And I will come to them as soon as possible to see when and what we can do in the future. But, President Officer, that is the difference. Ourselves, the Greens and Labour Party have been working to ensure that this Parliament can work and deliver for the people of Scotland. Not showboating, Members. not showboating and bringing in things that are unnatural ways of working for what this Parliament is all about, where we actually work together to ensure we deliver. So, quite simply, Presiding Officer, I am happy to stand by what we agreed at Bureau earlier today. Thank you. The question, the question is that Amendment 7367.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett, which seeks to amend Business Motion 7367 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, on changes to this week's business be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 7367.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett is yes 29, no 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7367.2 in the name of Neil Bibby, which seeks to amend Business Motion 7367 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed.
The result of the vote on amendment number 7367.2 in the name of Neil Bibby is yes 55, no 70. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that business motion 7367 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to this week's business be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on motion 7367 in the name of George Adam is yes 97, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 7332 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I call on George Adam to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you. No member is asked to speak on the motion. The question is that motion 7332 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 7333 on approval of an SSI and 7335 on designation of a lead committee. All moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The, questions on these, the question on these motions will be put at decision time. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business, and I propose to ask a single question on two Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects. The question is that motions 7333 on approval of an SSI and 7335 on designation of a lead committee in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting.